This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, The Education of a Personage. Chapter Two, Experiments in Convalescence. Part One. The Knickerbocker Bar, beamed upon by Maxfield Parrish's jovial, colorful old King Cole, was well crowded. Amory stopped in the entrance and looked at his wristwatch. He wanted particularly to know the time, for something in his mind that catalogued and classified liked to chip things off cleanly. Later it would satisfy him in a vague way to be able to think that things ended exactly twenty minutes after eight on Thursday, June tenth, nineteen nineteen. This was allowing for the walk from her house a walk concerning which he had afterward not the faintest recollection. He was in rather grotesque condition. Two days of worry and nervousness, of sleepless nights, of untouched meals, culminating in the emotional crisis and Rosalind's abrupt decision. The strain of it had drugged the foreground of his mind into a merciful coma. As he fumbled clumsily with the olives at the free lunch table, a man approached and spoke to him, and the olives dropped from his nervous hands. Well, Amory! It was someone he had known at Princeton. He had no idea of the name. Hello, old boy, he heard himself saying. Name's Jim Wilson. You've forgotten. Sure, you bet, Jim. I remember. Going to reunion? You know. Simultaneously he realized that he was not going to reunion. Get overseas? Amory nodded, his eyes staring oddly. Stepping back to let someone pass, he knocked the dish of olives to a crash on the floor. "'Too bad,' he muttered. "'Have a drink?' Wilson, ponderously diplomatic, reached over and slapped him on the back. "'You've had plenty, old boy.' Amory eyed him dumbly until Wilson grew embarrassed under the scrutiny. "'Plenty hell,' said Amory finally. I haven't had a drink today. Wilson looked incredulous. Have a drink or not? cried Amory rudely. Together they sought the bar. Rye high. I'll just take a Bronx. Wilson had another. Amory had several more. They decided to sit down. At ten o'clock, Wilson was displaced by Carling, class of fifteen. Amory, his head spinning gorgeously, layer upon layer of soft satisfaction setting over the bruised spots of his spirit, was discoursing volubly on the war. Cemental he was, he insisted with owl-like wisdom. Two years my life spent in intellectual vacuity, lost idealism, got be physical animal. He shook his fist expressively at old King Cole. Got be Prussian about everything, women specially. Used be straight bout women college. Now don't give a damn. He expressed his lack of principle by sweeping a seltzer bottle with a broad gesture to noisy extinction on the floor. But this did not interrupt his speech. Seek pleasure where find it for tomorrow die. Ask philosophy for me now on. Carling yawned. But Amory, waxing brilliant, continued. Use wonder bout things. People satisfied, compromise, fiffy-fiffy, attitude on life. Now don't wonder, don't wonder. He became so emphatic on impressing on Carling the fact that he didn't wonder, that he lost the thread of his discourse, and concluded by announcing to the bar at large that he was a physical animal. What are you celebrating, Amory? Amory leaned forward confidentially. Celebrating blow my life. Great moment blow my life. Can't tell you about it. He heard Carling address a remark to the bartender. Give him a bromo seltzer. Amory shook his head indignantly. None that stuff. But listen, Amory, you're making yourself sick. You're white as a ghost. Amory considered the question. He tried to look at himself in the mirror, but even by squinting up one eye, 
could only see as far as the row of bottles behind the bar. "'Like some solid. We go get some... some... salad.' He settled his coat with an attempt at nonchalance, but letting go of the bar was too much for him, and he slumped against a chair. "'We'll go over to Shanley's,' suggested Carling, offering an elbow. With this assistance Amory managed to get his legs in motion enough to propel him across 42nd Street. Shanley's was very dim. He was conscious that he was talking in a loud voice, very succinctly and convincingly, he thought, about a desire to crush people under his heel. He consumed three club sandwiches, devouring each as though it were no larger than a chocolate drop. Then Rosalind began popping into his mind again, and he found his lips forming her name over and over. Next he was sleepy, and he had a hazy, listless sense of people in dress suits, probably waiters, gathering round the table. He was in a room, and Carling was saying something about a knot in his shoelace. Nem mine, he managed to articulate drowsily, sleep in em. Still alcoholic. He woke laughing, and his eyes lazily roamed his surroundings, evidently a bedroom and bath in a good hotel. His head was whirling, and picture after picture was forming and blurring and melting before his eyes. But beyond the desire to laugh, he had no entirely conscious reaction. He reached for the phone beside his bed. "'Hello. What hotel is this? Knickerbocker? All right. Send up two rye highballs.' He lay for a moment, and wondered idly whether they'd send up a bottle, or just two of those little glass containers. Then, with an effort, he struggled out of bed and ambled into the bathroom. When he emerged, rubbing himself lazily with a towel, he found the bar-boy with the drinks and had a sudden desire to kid him. On reflection he decided that this would be undignified, so he waved him away. As the new alcohol tumbled into his stomach and warmed him, the isolated pictures began slowly to form a cinema reel of the day before. Again he saw Rosalind curled weeping among the pillows. Again he felt her tears against his cheek. Her words began ringing in his ears. Don't ever forget me, Amory. Don't ever forget me. Hell! he faltered aloud. Then he choked and collapsed on the bed in a shaken spasm of grief. After a minute he opened his eyes and regarded the ceiling. "'Damned fool!' he exclaimed in disgust, and with a voluminous sigh rose and approached the bottle. After another glass he gave way loosely to the luxury of tears. Purposely he called up into his mind little incidents of the vanished spring, phrased to himself emotions that would make him react even more strongly to sorrow. We were so happy, he intoned dramatically, so very happy. Then he gave way again and knelt beside the bed, his head half buried in the pillow. My own girl, my own, oh! He clinched his teeth so that the tears streamed in a flood from his eyes. Oh, my baby girl, all I had, all I wanted. Oh, my girl, come back, come back, I need you need you. You're so pitiful. Just misery we brought each other. She'll be shut away from me. I can't see her. I can't be her friend. It's got to be that way. It's got to be. And then again. We've been so happy, so very happy. He rose to his feet and threw himself on the bed in an ecstasy of sentiment, and then lay exhausted while he realized slowly that he had been very drunk the night before, and that his head was spinning again wildly. He laughed, rose, and crossed again to Lethe. At noon he ran into a crowd in the Biltmore bar, and the riot began again. He had a vague recollection afterward of discussing French poetry with a British officer, who was introduced to him as Captain Corn of His Majesty's Foot, and he remembered attempting to recite Claire de Lune at luncheon. Then he slept in a big, soft chair, until almost five o'clock when another crowd found and woke him. There followed an alcoholic dressing of several temperaments, for the ordeal of dinner. 
They selected theatre tickets at Tyson's for a play that had a four-drink program, a play with two monotonous voices, with turbid, gloomy scenes, and lighting effects that were hard to follow when his eyes behaved so amazingly. He imagined afterward that it must have been the jest. Then the coconut grove, where Amory slept again on a little balcony outside. Out in Shanley's, Yonkers, he became almost logical, and by a careful control of the number of highballs he drank, grew quite lucid and garrulous. He found that the party consisted of five men, two of whom he knew slightly. He became righteous about paying his share of the expense, and insisted in a loud voice on arranging everything then and there to the amusement of the tables around him. Someone mentioned that a famous cabaret star was at the next table, so Amory rose and, approaching gallantly, introduced himself. This involved him in an argument, first with her escort and then with the head waiter. Amory's attitude being a lofty and exaggerated courtesy, he consented, after being confronted with irrefutable logic, to being led back to his own table. "'Decided to commit suicide,' he announced suddenly. "'When? Next year?' "'Now. Tomorrow morning. Going to take a room at the Commodore. Get into a hot bath and open a vein. "'He's getting morbid. You need another wry, old boy. We'll all talk it over tomorrow.' But Amory was not to be dissuaded, from argument at least. "'Did you ever get that way?' he demanded confidentially for Taccio. "'Sure.' "'Often? My chronic state.' This provoked discussion. One man said he got so depressed sometimes that he seriously considered it. Another agreed that there was nothing to live for. Captain Corn, who had somehow rejoined the party, said that in his opinion it was when one's health was bad that one felt that way most. Amory's suggestion was that they should each order a Bronx, mix broken glass in it, and drink it off. To his relief, no one applauded the idea, so having finished his highball, he balanced his chin in his hand and his elbow on the table, a most delicate, scarcely noticeable sleeping position, he assured himself, and went into a deep stupor. He was awakened by a woman clinging to him, a pretty woman with brown disarranged hair and dark blue eyes. "'Take me home,' she cried. "'Hullo,' said Amory, blinking. "'I like you,' she announced tenderly. "'I like you, too.' He noticed that there was a noisy man in the background, and that one of his party was arguing with him. "'Fella I was with's a damn fool,' confided the blue-eyed woman. "'I hate him.' I want to go home with you. You drunk? queried Amory with intense wisdom. She nodded coyly. Go home with him, he advised gravely. He brought you. At this point the noisy man in the background broke away from his detainers and approached. Say, he said fiercely, I brought this girl out here and you're butting in. Amory regarded him coldly, while the girl clung to him closer. "'You let go that girl!' cried the noisy man. Amory tried to make his eyes threatening. "'You go to hell,' he directed finally, and turned his attention to the girl. "'Love first sight?' he suggested. "'I love you,' she breathed and nestled close to him. She did have beautiful eyes. Someone leaned over and spoke in Amory's ear. "'That's just Margaret Diamond.' She's drunk, and this fellow here brought her. Better let her go. Let him take care of her, then, shouted Amory furiously. I'm no YWCA worker, am I? Am I? Let her go. It's her hanging on, damn it. Let her hang. The crowd around the table thickened. For an instant a brawl threatened, but a sleek waiter bent back Margaret Diamond's fingers until she released her hold on Amory whereupon she slapped the waiter furiously in the face, and flung her arms about her raging original escort. "'Oh, Lord!' cried Amory. "'Let's go. Come on, the taxis are getting scarce. Check, waiter. Come on, Amory, your romance is over.' Amory laughed. "'You don't know how true you spoke. No idea. 
That's the whole trouble. Amory on the Labor Question Two mornings later he knocked at the President's door at Bascom and Barlow's advertising agency. Come in. Amory entered unsteadily. Morning, Mr. Barlow. Mr. Barlow brought his glasses to the inspection, and set his mouth slightly ajar that he might better listen. Well, Mr. Blaine, we haven't seen you for several days. No, said Amory, I'm quitting. Well, well, this is— I don't like it here. I'm sorry. I thought our relationship had been quite, uh, pleasant. You seem to be a hard worker. A little inclined, perhaps, to write fancy copy. I just got tired of it, interrupted Amory rudely. It didn't matter a damn to me whether Harebell's flour was any better than anyone else's. In fact, I never ate any of it. So I got tired of telling people about it. Oh, I know I've been drinking. Mr. Barlow's face steeled by several ingots of expression. You asked for a position. Amory waved him to silence. And I think I was rottenly underpaid. Thirty-five dollars a week? Less than a good carpenter. You had just started. You never worked before, said Mr. Barlow coolly. But it took about ten thousand dollars to educate me where I could write your darn stuff for you. Anyway, as far as length of service goes, you've got stenographers here you've paid fifteen a week for five years. I'm not going to argue with you, sir, said Mr. Barlow, rising. Neither am I. I just wanted to tell you I'm quitting. They stood for a moment looking at each other impassively, and then Amory turned and left the office. A LITTLE LULL Four days after that, he returned at last to the apartment. Tom was engaged on a book review for the New Democracy on the staff of which he was employed. They regarded each other for a moment in silence. Well? Well? Good Lord, Amory! Where'd you get the black eye? And the jaw? Amory laughed. That's a mere nothing. He peeled off his coat and bared his shoulders. Look here. Tom emitted a low whistle. What hit you? Amory laughed again. Oh, a lot of people. I got beaten up. Fact. He slowly replaced his shirt. It was bound to come sooner or later, and I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Who was it? Well, there were some waiters and a couple of sailors, and a few stray pedestrians, I guess. It's the strangest feeling. You ought to get beaten up just for the experience of it. You fall down after a while, and everybody sort of slashes in at you before you hit the ground. Then they kick you. Tom lighted a cigarette. I spent a day chasing you all over town, Amory, but you always kept a little ahead of me. I'd say you've been on some party. Amory tumbled into a chair and asked for a cigarette. You sober now? asked Tom quizzically. Pretty sober, why? Well, Alec has left. His family had been after him to go home and live, so he— A spasm of pain shook Amory. Too bad. Yes, it is too bad. We'll have to get someone else if we're going to stay here. The rent is going up. Sure, get anybody. I'll leave it to you, Tom. Amory walked into his bedroom. The first thing that met his glance was a photograph of Rosalind that he had intended to have framed, propped up against a mirror on his dresser. He looked at it unmoved. After the vivid mental pictures of her that were his portion at present, the portrait was curiously unreal. He went back into the study. Got a cardboard box? No, answered Tom, puzzled. Why should I have? Oh, yes, there may be one in Alec's room. Eventually Amory found what he was looking for, and returning to his dresser, opened a drawer full of letters, notes, part of a chain, two little handkerchiefs, and some snapshots. As he transferred them carefully to the box, his mind wandered to some place in a book, where the hero, after preserving for a year a cake of his lost love's soap, finally washed his hands with it. He laughed and began to hum after you've gone. Ceased abruptly. The string broke twice, and then he managed to secure it, dropped the package into the bottom of his trunk, 
and having slammed the lid, returned to the study. "'Going out?' Tom's voice held an undertone of anxiety. "'Uh-huh. Where?' "'Couldn't say, old Keed. "'Let's have dinner together. "'Sorry. I told Suki Bread I'd eat with him. "'Oh. bye bye Amory crossed the street and had a highball. Then he walked to Washington Square and found a top seat on a bus. He disembarked at 43rd Street and strolled to the Biltmore Bar. "'Hi, Amory. What'll you have? Yo-ho, waiter!' End of Book Two, Chapter Two, Part One